Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Bailey Gordon. I have the pleasure of serving as the interim executive director for Oklahoma Ethics. So um, this is my second month and it's definitely been an exciting one with making all of these changes. So um, we are so glad that you're here today and that you're joining us. Um, a few things, we do have CPE credit available for this today. Um, if you have not yet, you can request that by emailing um, okethicssupport at okethics.com. I'll put that in the chat so that you can see it. And you can also just um, use the chat feature at the bottom and just say CPE in your name and we'll email that to you following, um, following the event. So um, if you do need that, those are available on, upon request. So please just put your, um, your name in the chat and we'll get that to you. Um, another thing, we will, um, we do want this to be interactive. So as you have a question, please put that in our, um, in our Q&A. Perfect. I see one already in there. Um, so, and I'm seeing our CPEs come up. Perfect. Um, so if you do have a question for, um, for Thomas Hill, our speaker, please put that in our Q&A box and we'll get to those um, toward the end of the program. Um, and I think that is about all that I have for you. So um, we can go ahead and get started. You can see here that Travis Jones is here with us. He is going to be doing our guiding principle and introducing our speaker today. So just a quick little bit about Travis. He is one of our great um, board members for Oklahoma Ethics. And his philosophy is to provide world-class service for his clients by demonstrating professionalism and commitment to helping individuals and organizations. His company, Career Development Partners, focuses on professional and executive search, retention strategies, succession planning, human resource consulting, outplacement, e-learning via Skillsoft, um, and then also knowledge transfer and executive coaching. So um, companies entrust their employees to their care protection and membership. So he has had a wonderful career and has been um, involved in many, many different organizations in um, the Tulsa area as well as in the state that, um, that include Oklahoma Business, Business Ethics Consortium, the Heart Walk, the Tulsa Executive Association, um, and then I noticed some others like New Life Ranch and Tulsa Chamber of Commerce. So thank you so much, Travis, for being here, for helping us get this all set up. Um, and also for introducing our speaker and our guiding principal for today. I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you, Bailey. You know, uh, I'm like Tom, I also like uh, the hugs and the handshakes. I'm looking forward to seeing you again, but mostly if you look closely, I'm looking for a good haircut. Tom, where do you get your haircut? <laughs> You've got um, it down. I, I cut my own hair, Travis, uh, once a week, whether it needs it or not. It takes me about three and a half minutes. So uh, this has not interrupted me at all. You know, I may have to try that. My father was bald as well, and so uh, he would do the same thing and cut it. So, at any rate, I'd like to uh, share with you uh, at this time uh, a combination of some of our guiding principles by telling a story. And so the story I want to tell is, is about Dwight Eisenhower. This happened in June of 1944, and uh, he was walking on the beach alone with his thoughts. And he would stop and share across the waters, the English Channel, look towards the coast of France. And that's where the Nazi armies had built a military fortress. The next dawn, he knew that hundreds of ships and sailors would storm that coast. And he knew that uh, many of these soldiers, more than likely, this would be their last morning. And in fact, 2,499 of these soldiers, American soldiers, lost their lives that next day, and there was 1,915 Allied so, uh, soldiers that did. So as he walked along, he uh, ran across an American private, and this guy was standing by himself also just looking across the ocean. And a general asked him, what are you thinking about? And right away, the soldier said back to him, home. So then this uh, Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces, he suggested that they walk together, that perhaps they could draw confidence and courage from one another with each other's company. So the two men walked on, one was older, one younger, one experienced in the ways of war and the other inexperienced, but each man was drawing strength from the other. What I believe, that's exactly what we need to do today. We need others to walk along beside us, offering us wisdom and encouragement 
particularly in difficult times. As we know, our world is in turmoil in, uh, with this pandemic and people are losing their hope, they're losing their joy. Some are physically tired, uh, emotionally drained and overwhelmed with grief. And today, I believe more than ever, people need each other. It's times like this that we need to be reminded of the guiding principles that Oklahoma Ethics has. And if you're a member or if you're not, you can go to the website, oklahomaethics.org, OK and you can see the guiding principles for this organization. But these guiding principles were put together in July of 2004. And interestingly, Thomas's father, Tom Hill, was helpful in putting these guiding principles together. And uh, he did that through his Character First series. And so let me share with you some of those guiding principles. The first one is just a sense of responsibility to self and also to others. Talked about serving others, collaborating with others, respecting others, uh, the need for encouragement, and courage to step up to the task of serving and helping other people. So I'm thankful for all those who serve others with a sense of integrity and honor. And all these, again, are principles that Oklahoma Ethics is involved with. I'm also very thankful for the uh, global healthcare workers that have uh, stepped up around the world just to support people. And uh, studies have shown that when healthcare workers provide encouragement to the their patients that they recuperate, recuperate faster. And, and you know, I, I just appreciate what's going on around the world. We too can be a part of encouraging others by serving them and respecting them and honoring them. The fact is that all human beings have incredible worth. And it does take courage. It takes uh, intentionality to reach out to people at times like this. And of course, we always want to be reminded that, the, that every person has incredible worth and it's worth serving them. There's a proverb that I really love. It says this, it says, gracious words are honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. So I just want to encourage you, if you're listening in today, to, to be about uh, giving gracious and healing words to others. And what we're going to learn today from Thomas is that this is the Kim Ray way to do things. So I love the fact that I get to introduce our speaker today. And so I want to tell you a little bit about Thomas Hill. Thomas Hill III. He's the chief executive officer of Kim Ray. It's a leading manufacturer of valves and controls for oil and gas production. His grandfather, Kimmel, uh, Garmin Kimmel, founded the company in 1948. And uh, today they employ over 500 people. And I'm sure that right now the number's a little bit down, but in, in general, you have over 500 people in your Oklahoma City offices. You have locations throughout the United States. Thomas grew up in the company. He's worked in almost every single department. You'll hear some of his story today. And he has an intimate knowledge of the people and the processes from start to finish. He's a great CEO for his company. Uh, he's also the author of a book, Recovering Leadership, Musings of an Addict Leader. And uh, this week I was telling Thomas before we started that, that I had a chance to reread his book this week and, and I've just about finished it. And a fantastic book. And, and what he talks about is being an addict leader that had to hit rock, rock bottom to find his way to live and to work for uh, what he was called to do. Thomas is married to Rebecca. Both of them went to OSU. And, and I read in the book, and Thomas, I hope you don't mind me saying this, <laughs> that uh, she graduated in four years. It took you seven years. And you, that may be part of your story, but she's a quick learner. And you uh, married up, I know. You've been married for 30 years. You have six children and uh, currently serve as the vice chair of Hope is Alive. And in that organization, he mentors uh, men that are recovering addicts. He also does a Monday Musing, which if you uh, go to his uh, site, uh, recoveringleadership.com, you can receive that each week. Thomas will share his life story with us today. His story of success is also his story of failure and recovery. And in doing so, he's going to challenge us today to create an ethical workplace and a place where people are respected, where people are valued as human beings. So please help me welcome uh, Thomas Hill III. Thomas? Well, Travis, thank you very much. Uh, it was very kind. Um, to be clear, my wife graduated in three years. 
and uh, I graduated in seven. So there's no question who the smarter person is, more intelligent person is in, in my family. It's definitely her. And I think she works harder than I do too. So uh, we'll give her that credit. Well, yes, I am Thomas, and I am a recovering addict leader. And uh, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what that means, and we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, my journey. But one of the things that Travis said at the, at the beginning, he used the word integrity. I actually went on the OK Ethics website again, just to make sure they hadn't changed what was on the, on the website since the last time I was there. And it's still right up at the top on the banner says, promoting integrity at work. Uh, that's what we're doing with OK Ethics, promoting integrity at work. So I looked up what integrity means. And integrity, one of the definitions of integrity is it's the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles and the state of being whole and undivided. So I want you to remember those two words, two words out of that, honest and undivided. We're going to come back to those words several times as, as we talk today. You know, we often think of ethical behavior in terms of not violating the law or maybe just not violating the generally accepted rules of conduct. And we refer to ethical cultures because that's what we're interested in here, right, is promoting an ethical culture in the environments and the communities and the workplaces that we're a part of. We refer to those ethical cultures as those that promote adherence to those standards, whether those are legal standards or commonly accepted standards. And I think that's great. Uh, that's fine and dandy. Wonderful. Unless the standard is wrong. And I want to talk to you a little bit today about the possibility that some of the things that we kind of generally accept, or at least are uh, more or less accepted in, in the culture that we're in, may not be actually a way to ethically treat people and, and to have ethical organizations. So uh, I'm in recovery. That's not something that's a, a secret. And if you're, if you have any connection with the recovery world, I'm, I'm assuming that in this large of a group, there's a number of us that are in recovery, then you're probably familiar with the 12 steps. And in, in recovery meetings and 12 step meetings, one of the things we do is we tell our story. It's uh, helpful to us to remind ourselves uh, where we've come from and, and what we've come through. It's also helpful to other people as they're maybe finding their way through something. And, and so that's something that we do. And we're taught in recovery a kind of a specific way to tell our story. We always talk about the way things were, what happened, and the way things are now. And so that's what I want to do with you today. I want to talk about those, those kind of those three sections of my life. So we're going to start with the way things were. When I was young, uh, I always wanted to be an engineer. Uh, from as early as I can remember, I wanted to be an engineer. And I did a lot of things that were kind of engineering. I was a, I was a nerd. I'm just going to be, be straight up. I was a nerd. I was one of those guys. I wasn't cool like I am now. I was, I was a complete nerd. And very young, very young age, I learned how to build and launch model rockets. Maybe some of you have participated in, in that. And I loved that. There was a lot of science and a lot of physics involved. And I learned uh, how to calculate based on the rocket and the engine I used and how I launched the rocket. I would calculate where the rocket would go, the, the path of the rocket and how high it would get and how far away from me it would get. And then with wind speed and stuff, you could kind of figure out where it, where it should come down. That got to be really important because uh, it wasn't too long before I started arming the rockets that I was building. I had access to gunpowder and some other things and I figured out how to basically create uh, propelled bombs. And so knowing where they were gonna land got to be really, really important. And I would launch them from my house uh, about two blocks away, try to get them to land about two blocks away in an empty field in a, uh, next to a school that was in our neighborhood. And the first time one of my rockets didn't go where I intended it to go, which would have been tragic if it had hit anything important, uh, I had to figure out what had gone wrong. I, being a, a, an engineering brain kind of person, I wanted to kind of do the root cause now, so I didn't even know what that word meant, but I wanted to know what had happened, what had gone wrong. And so I started looking into all the different things, the mistakes I could have made in calculations and variations. And, and the, the, the root cause I determined was really fairly simple. My mother had bought me a launching platform for my rockets, right? It was a little metal disc and it had a metal rod and, and a thing that you could adjust the angle um, so that you could point the rocket in a certain direction. And that was all fine and dandy, but that rod was a little bit flimsy 
And what I realized was as the rocket went up the rod, it had the possibility of flexing that rod a little bit. And so the actual angle and direction that the rocket left, there was some variation there. If that, if that moved a little bit, then that, that rocket could go a different direction than I had intended it. And that slight variation, because it was really just a fraction of a degree, but that slight variation produced a fairly significant deviation in where the rocket ended up, which became kind of significant when you were loading them with explosives. So uh, that's, that's what I learned. Unfortunately, that was an, an incredible opportunity for me to learn something about life. And at that point in time, I didn't learn that lesson. It took a lot longer for me to learn that lesson. I grew up uh, in a very uh, competitive uh, family. You know, if you know anything about my grandfather, Garmin Kimmel, he was a genius. Uh, by the time he died, he had 44 patents to his name. He had started a couple of different companies, become very, very successful. And, and it wasn't just the things that he was involved in, in terms of Kim Ray, that were, uh, that were kind of exciting. My grandfather was involved in the uh, beginning of open heart surgery in Oklahoma. He built a lot of the equipment that the doctors used in the operating rooms as they were uh, developing open heart surgery as a, as a viable alternative. He was involved in the recording industry built recording studios, recorded the symphony. He loved photography. He loved all kinds of things. And whatever he was interested in, he had the equipment, he had the tools, he had a complete machine shop at his house. And this is where I grew up. And at my house, if something broke or if we needed something, if it broke, we took it apart. We found the part that was broken. We engineered a better one, put it back together, and we had a better product. I mean, I just thought everybody did that. You know, everybody fixed their own, own stuff. And then my father... Uh, likewise, very, very intelligent man, uh, very driven, uh, decided to get out from underneath his dad's authority and join the Marines. That was a, a brilliant decision on his part, but he did very well in the Marines and spent a tour in Vietnam. And when he came back on the GI Bill, he got a degree in three years, got an engineering degree in three years with two kids and a wife and a house and everything else. And then I watched my father work his way up at Kim Ray from being an engineer to basically being in charge of a large part of the company. And then for most of his career, he was in fact in, uh, the leader of Kimray and watched him be involved in the community and church and all these different things. And here's what I saw when I, when I watched these men, these men who were very important to me, here's what I saw. I never saw them afraid. I never saw them uncertain. I never saw them wrong. My grandfather was never wrong and he would have told you that. Um, they just always seem to know what to do and how to do it and when to do it. And I never saw them be uncertain. Now, I'll be quick to point out, that doesn't mean that they weren't, right? I mean, they were human beings. And I now know as an adult and having talked to my grandfather, you know, before his death and my, my father's in my conversations now, they feel and felt just like everybody else. But I didn't see that. And so I got the impression or kind of got the message or internalized the message that to be a man and to be a leader and to be successful, I needed to be unafraid, completely certain. I needed to always be right, always have the solution. And that emotions or, or having, you know, having those emotions was kind of a, a weakness. And basically that success and, and accomplishing things were where value was. Um, that was a wrong message. Nobody told me that, but that's, that's, that was my interpretation. So I began very early to develop kind of a belief system, kind of how I looked at the world that basically said accomplishment and winning and being right equaled value. So that's where I got value. And that being emotional or failing or being uncertain was a weakness. That was weakness. And the problem is, is that our society reinforces that. Right. We're told all the time that we have to look a certain way, smell a certain way, drive a certain car. We're told that the things about us, the tangible things about us, our accomplishments and, and the way that we behave equals our value. That, that's really what we're told. Nobody says it that simply, but that's that's what we're being told. And so I grew up believing that accomplishment equaled value, that what I did was who was who I was, that what I did equaled my value. And early in my life, that wasn't really a problem. Um, I was firstborn. I'm a firstborn of a firstborn of a firstborn. Whether you believe in birth order stuff or not, we do tend to have some, some traits. And um, I'm obsessive compulsive. I don't sleep very much. And I got really good 
at doing. And I got really good at, at setting goals, deciding what I was going to do next and accomplishing it. And that's not necessarily a good thing. Uh, it's just the way I was wired. And so for a lot of my life, or certainly my early life, it was not difficult for me to uh, get my value. I, I felt valued because I accomplished the things that I wanted to accomplish. And then people praised me for that. And I got, I got accolades for that. I got moved up. I got, I got to move forward. The problem becomes twofold. One, um, in, in my own life, that became uh, more and more and more of a problem. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But then also as a leader, having that belief system became a problem. And the reason is something that, that I want you to remember. You're not going to remember a lot of what I say today, but I want you to remember this. And if you're taking notes, write this down. The culture in our organizations, whether that's a community, a family, a company, a city, a state, a nation, the culture that we experience is an organic result of the beliefs of that organization or that community or that system. And a lot of people don't think of, of organizations as having a belief system. A lot of people don't think their company necessarily has a belief system, but a belief system is simply that which determines what we do. We act according to our beliefs. And since corporations and organizations and communities do act corporately, then there must be an underlying belief system that directs those actions. So the culture that we, that we get, the culture that we experience when we're in those organizations or communities as an organic result of the belief system and the belief system of an organization is predominantly, not entirely, but predominantly influenced by the leader. Doesn't mean that everybody in the organization or the community doesn't have a role to play. They do but it's almost impossible to overcome the belief systems of the leadership of that organization. So that's going to be the kind of the telling uh, part of, of that system. So let's talk about what happened. So that's, that's kind of the way things were. That's how I grew up and, and that went fine for a while. Uh, but thinking that your value is associated with accomplishments it is kind of, uh, it's almost an, an addiction in and of itself. You get addicted to getting things done, accomplishing things. And as I got older and accomplished bigger and more things and bigger things, what started to happen was uh, before I was even done, before I could even enjoy the success of something that I was accomplishing or some project that I was going to bring to fruition or something that I created, before I could even enjoy that, before it was even over, I was already trying to figure out what the next thing I was going to do because I couldn't have a minute go by that I wasn't working on something else to continue creating value. It's, it's a treadmill, really, a performance treadmill that, that is very easy to get on and it's very easy to get off. Many of you have probably seen videos. I'm not going to admit to watching YouTube videos, but um, somebody showed me this. Let me just, I'll just put it that way so I don't have to admit that. But I'm sure you've seen a YouTube video of somebody doing something stupid on a treadmill and they fall on the treadmill, right? And what happens? They get kicked off the back end of the treadmill, right? And, and for some reason, probably for the sake of the video, the treadmill is always too close to a wall or a table with a lamp on it or something, right? When you're not you're supposed to have space behind your treadmill, but nevertheless, they get slung off that thing and slammed into the wall. And really that was kind of what was going on in my life. That treadmill that I was on was just going faster and faster and faster. And eventually something was going to happen, something tragic was going to happen. Another problem was, I said, the way I perceived how I would be successful as a man and successful as a leader, successful as a human really, was to have these traits of being certain and not being afraid and not having emotions. But that wasn't true for me, right? It's not true for anybody. It's not true for you all. You all have fears. You all have emotions. You all have things that you don't know. Right now, we're in a, in a time of great uncertainty. I know very few leaders who really have any idea what the future is going to be like. We're not even sure what two weeks from now is going to be like, much less two years from now. And yet, we're in the position where we're supposed to know. We're supposed to be making decisions. And so there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of fear. I felt that way my whole life, but I believed that I shouldn't. And that created a lot of shame and created a lot of emotional problems for me. And I had to find a way to deal with that. And so I started participating in behaviors. Um, I like to take risks. I like to drive motorcycles really fast. I like to drive cars really fast. I started doing things that would make me feel better, uh, would kind of medicate, if you would, the way that I was feeling 
the shame that I felt for not being what I thought I should be. And remember those words I was ta talking about, honesty and undivided. Well, first off, I wasn't being honest with myself or with anybody else during this period of my life. Why? Because I couldn't tell anybody that I was afraid. I couldn't tell anybody that I didn't know what needed to be done next. I had to pretend like I was cool, like everything was fine. And I wasn't undivided. I wasn't whole. I was divided because on the one hand, I was presenting one thing, but I really felt a different way. And that division within me would, would tear at me and create emotional turmoil and mental turmoil. And I had to do something with that. And so I developed a lot of behaviors that initially weren't a problem, but like all addictive behavior, what starts out to be useful eventually doesn't do any good and you have to do more. It doesn't matter whether it's drugs or alcohol or gambling or sex, or it doesn't matter what you're using to make yourself feel better, it has less and less and less effect. And you have to do more and more to kind of cover up the stuff. And so my life just got more and more and more out of control internally and externally. So addictions tend to present in, in three ways. They manifest, manifest themselves in three ways. There's a, pre, a persistent craving. So you get to the point where you can't not do or be what you are. There's a loss of control there that you finally get to the point where you're not controlling yourself anymore. This thing that's driving you is, and you continue to do things even if they had to have adverse conditions and adverse consequences. And that was exactly the situation I found myself in. I was uh, constantly needing to, to fuel this thing and I was not in control of what I was doing and, and, and who I was becoming. And I knew that there was going to be negative results and I couldn't do anything. I had really gotten to the point where I was an addict leader. And that's an interesting word. I've run into a lot of leaders uh, that I believe are, are displaying addictive behavior. Um, sometimes they're traditional addicts. Sometimes they're drinking or they're doing drugs on the side and they're trying to hold things together. But sometimes it's more about their behaviors. And a lot of times in leadership, we, come, we become addicted to the position we're in. We become addicted to the power and the influence that we have. And that's what's making us feel normal and what's making us feel better. And then we start doing things to make sure we maintain that, make sure that we stay in that position. So I had kind of all of that going on. And like I already told you, it was having those things I was doing were having less and less and less effect for me. But the cravings, the need kept getting more and more and more. Addiction is an a, a, very selfish thing. And so you're really just thinking about yourself. I was just thinking about myself. I was just doing what I needed to do. And as a leader, if a leader is selfish and if a leader is trying to meet their own needs, then that's going to create a toxic culture. And that's what was happening at Kimmery. Um, I created a toxic culture. And let's go back to those words again, honesty. There was a total lack of honesty. I was not being honest with the people at Kimmery about what was really going on in my life. And because I needed to orchestrate things to be a certain way, I wasn't telling everybody the same story. Now I would give everybody a piece of the vision or a piece of what we were uh, trying to accomplish so that they would get on board, but I would only give them the piece that I needed them to do because the, the real vision was for me to get the credit. The real vision was for me to accomplish something so that I would feel okay, so that I would have that value. And you can't tell people that the real vision is for you to get the credit, right? You have to tell them something else. So there was a lack of honesty there. And then because I was not sharing uh, a, an inclusive vision, I wasn't talking to them about something that everybody could get on board with, there was not unity. We were divided, right? Everybody's working for themselves. Here's another really interesting thing about this is if my belief system, if my belief as a leader or yours, if your belief as a leader is that your value comes from what you accomplish, then what do you believe about everybody else? You believe the same thing, right? You believe that their value is based on what they accomplish. Now, do you think I thought anybody did as much work as I did or accomplished as much as I accomplished? Absolutely not. I, I worked harder than everybody else. I sleep less than everybody else, right? And so by definition, because of my belief system, whether I would have admitted it or not, I valued everybody else less than I valued myself. And that's typically true in these types of cultures where people are competing for value. The farther up the organizational chart you get, the more those people think that they're, they're, they have more value than the people that are farther down on the organizational chart. I have found that nobody has a problem with an organizational chart in a, in, a, in a 
company or an organization, everybody understands there needs to be division of responsibility. Different people have different decisions to make. People at Kimberly understand that I make some decisions that nobody else makes. The problem isn't the organizational chart. The problem is when I start acting like I'm more valuable than anybody else in the organization, that's what people have a problem with. And that was what was going on at Kimray. Another problem, when, once you've created a toxic environment and you've got people that are competing for value, that's a high stress environment. And one of the things that, that we fail to, to recognize a lot of times is something called finite reserve capacity. People have a finite capacity for stress. And they have stress in lots of areas of their lives, right? They have stress at home and stress, personal stress. And we don't even often know all the different things that are going on, going on in their lives. And when that gets completely used up, when they've, got, when they've used up their, their finite, the finite capacity that they have, then they really can't handle any more stress. And the problem for a leader is that change and innovation and being flexible in an organization are stressful. Those things create stress. And so if the toxicity of the environment is burning through people's finite reserve capacity, not only do they have nothing to take home with them, which is a moral issue as far as I'm concerned from a leadership standpoint, they also don't have anything to give at work. And so you find that your organization in a toxic environment, your organization becomes inflexible and not able to pivot and not able to handle the change and the things that are going on. And you, you know, th this, there are comics written about that. I mean, if you think about the office, there's a lot of things that are going on there that we laugh at when they're stretched to their, to kind of a, a hyper example. But the fact of the matter is those, those are underlying truths and all those things that happen every day in organizations. And they happen because of that, that loss of value. And so I had created an environment at Kimray. I'm a, I'm the, the president of Kimray now. This is about uh, 10 years ago. I'm the president of Kimray, and I've functionally, because of my belief system, created a culture that is literally sucking the life out of other people. They're competing with each other for value. They're, they're silos. There's a lack of communication. There's a lack of clear understanding about what we're trying to accomplish. Um, and it's not because I wasn't a good communicator. I was communicating what I wanted people to know, but there wasn't unity in, in what they were trying to accomplish. And I wasn't being honest and therefore the organization wasn't honest. I tell people all the time, I get to talk about culture uh, pretty often and I'm not sure that sometimes when the leaders of an organization bring me in to talk about culture, I'm not sure they're happy because one of the first things I tell everyone is, if you're unhappy with the culture in your organization, you need different leadership. <laughs> and sometimes the leaders are, are the ones that are the problems. Now, you don't necessarily have to change the people out, but, but a lot of times that, that's what ends up happening. And the, and the change that needs to occur in that leadership is transformational, not tactical. It's not that you need to do different things. It's that you need to be a different person. And so Kim Ray needed different leadership. And in May of 2012, uh, the, the company, actually my family, that most of the stockholders are my family members, uh, made that change. They decided they wanted a different culture at Kim Ray and they made the change. And I got fired. I was the president of Kim Ray. They fired me and removed me from the board. And that was an extremely dark a couple of days for me. In fact, uh, I was lost. I was completely lost. And I went to see a counselor and just kind of started pouring everything out, all of the stuff that I had, had been, been holding back and been putting in boxes and putting up on the mental shelves and just let all that out. And at the end of that, it was about an eight hours I spent in his office and my wife was there part of the time at the end of all of that. Everybody decided that the best thing for me would be uh, that I needed to get some intensive help. And so I actually went to rehab for 67 days. I spent 67 days in rehab. And when I came back, uh, I didn't have a job. Uh, the only thing I had ever been that my identity was and what I wanted since from first grade on is I wanted to run Kimray. I wanted to be an engineer. I wanted to run Kimray. And I had achieved that. And that was my identity. And now that was gone. I didn't think I'd ever be able to come back to Kimray. I didn't think that would ever, ever be my life again. And that put me in a position where I really had to figure out uh, who I was and who I wanted to be and what my identity needed to be. While I was in rehab, probably the most important thing I learned, the most transformational change for me, was that was when I learned that my value wasn't associated with my accomplishment, that it didn't make any difference what I did, whether I did a lot or did a little, 
that didn't change my value. And it didn't change mine, and therefore it doesn't change anybody else's. That everybody is equally and intrinsically valuable. I'm gonna say that again. Every human being is equally and intrinsically valuable. We have different skills, we have different education, we have different capabilities, but none of those things define our value. Our value is intrinsic in our humanity. And we need to treat one another in a way that represents that. So things had gotten bad. Um, I had gotten fired. I'm home now. I don't have a job and I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, and about a year goes by and, um, and I had processed all that. And I, I thought I'd never come back to Cameron. and I was okay with that, that it kind of died for me. And I'd started another company and, and we were going to just kind of do life that way. And, um, but the difference in my life was prior to that, for most of my adult life, I had woken up every morning uh, kind of panicked that that would be the day that everybody would figure out that I was a fraud, that I wasn't um, really who I said I was and wasn't capable of doing all the things I said I was capable of. And after that event, uh, I was at peace. So for the first time in my life, I actually was at peace. I actually uh, could sleep at night and, and wake up rested and enjoyed myself and enjoyed the world around me and enjoyed people. and. And for that matter, I, I like flowers. I like, I mean, I can find beauty almost anywhere I am. And before I didn't notice any of that. I was so, so much in a hurry to just get to the next thing. And so I had been living like that for a year and, and it had made a lot of difference. The people around me could tell that. And the board of directors at Kimray called me and said, hey, we would like to talk to you about the possibility of coming back to Kimray. And so over the course of a couple of months, we worked that out and I got the opportunity. I got an amazing gift, an amazing opportunity to return to a place where I had failed, I had messed up, I had created a toxic culture, I had not been the leader that Kim Ray needed. I got an opportunity to come back and kind of redeem that. And interestingly, I, they brought me back as the vice president of manufacturing, which is a position I had held almost 15 years before, working for a guy I had hired when I was president of the company. So that was a little humbling, but that was actually a good thing for me and it gave me a chance to to see how I would handle being back in the, in the environment. And, and that was going well. And so after a while, um, I got reinstalled as CEO. That's been about five years ago. And, and so now I get to tell you about the fun part of my story. So we talked about, you know, how things used to be and what happened. My life blew up, imploded, I got fired. That was kind of the dark time. That was hitting rock bottom. But now I have an opportunity, have had and continue to have an opportunity uh, to kind of make living amends. That's one of the things we talk about in recovery is living our life in a way that, that is, uh, is consistent with what we say we want to be true about ourselves. And so this is the fun part. This is, this is kind of the fun part of Kim Ray in the, in the Kim Ray way. We have a new belief system at Kim Ray, and that belief system I've already told you, the value is intrinsic. And the currency that we use, the currency that we use to demonstrate that to people is respect. And so I say often, I don't want to be respected less, but I think everybody at Kim Ray should be respected the same as the CEO. And we try to live that out in our policies and our procedures, the way we interact with one another, the way we treat one another. It's a good question as a leader to ask yourself, what actually motivates people? Why do people do what they do? And there's really three ways that people are motivated. They're either motivated by habit. I brush my teeth every morning. I hope you do too. I don't think about it. It's not written down. I don't have a to-do list. I don't have a reminder. It's not possible for me to wake up without walking into the bathroom, doing the handful of things I need to do, and one of them is brushing my teeth. I just do it every day. That's a habit. Sometimes people do things by compulsion. I believe a lot of people do what they do at work by compulsion. They're told to do it, and they don't have a choice because they need a paycheck, they may not be happy, they may not be fulfilled, they may not be respected, they may not be treated well, but they don't have a choice. They show up every day and they grudgingly, being compel compelled, do what you ask them to do or what they're told to do because they have to. But the most, uh, the, the most important and, and really the, the, the most, uh, I'm losing my word here, but the way that, that it's best to, to get people to do things is by hooking into what they're passionate about. When people do things because of passion, then they're really invested. That's what it looks like if you're a grandparent and you're showing pictures of your grandkids. You're passionate about that and nobody can get you to shut up about that, right? Or, you know, if, you, if something has really happened in your life um, 
My father, you know, has had some medical issues and every once in a while he comes across something that really works for him and he tells everybody else about it, right? He wants people to know, hey, this might make you feel better. This might make you, he's passionate about that. So when we're passionate about something, we're motivated. And one of the ways, probably the most important way as leaders that we can give people a way to hook their passion into what we're doing as a community is through a vision and a mission, having a mission for our, for our organization and, and giving them a vision. A great mission is always going to answer the question, why are we doing this? Why do I come to work every day? Why am I pushing this paper across my desk every day? And there, there needs to be a way to connect to something that they can be passionate about. At Kim Ray, our mission is to make a difference in the lives of the people that we serve. Our mission is not to make vows. Our mission is not to make money. Our mission is not to be world-class in anything. It's not to be the best valve company or the best service company. Uh, it's not to you know, grow to a certain level. Our mission is simply to make a positive difference in the lives of the people that we come in contact. We start internally with, with the people at Kimray, and then we move out in rings, right? The local community that we're a part of, the city that we're a part of, the state we're a part of, and ultimately the nation and the world. And our, of course, our impact lessens, just like the ripples in a, in a pond, those ripples get smaller and you know, lighter and lighter as you go out. But nevertheless, we, we do that. And so the question is, can everyone in your organization align with the mission? Well, everybody can align with making a difference in people's lives, right? Every single person at Kimray can do something every day that impacts somebody else positively. And then we can tie the work that they do, even if what they do is pulling parts so we can build valves. We say, well, you do a really good job of that, it improves our margins. When our margins are good, some money drops to the bottom line. We take some of that money and we help Habitat build a house. And then we let you go out and participate in that. And so we connect people to what we do and that keeps them uh, plugged into our mission and how every step that they take every day does in fact link to that. Second of all, all the things we do as an organization have to connect people to that mission. And so we start with onboarding. We, we do character first. I know a lot of the, a lot of the corporations and companies that are a part of OK Ethics are, are also involved in character first. We're an open, man, open book management company. That goes back to that honesty. Transparency is honest. And so we tell everybody uh, what our, you know, where our money goes, where our money comes from, everything that's going on with that. All the technology that we use, we share our community impact, our personal, the benefits that we give our people are all tied to and, and we continue to communicate, this is what we're doing and this is, this is why we're doing it. And so because of that mission, because everybody can tie themselves to that mission, we are undivided. Another word for undivided is unity. We have unity at Kimray because everybody's pulling in the same direction. It's something that they can be passionate about. And we have honesty because we're transparent as a company. And then as leaders, we model that transparency. So uh, I tell my story. There's a lot of people who probably wouldn't go around telling people that they had failed. Uh, but, you know, it happened. And there were a lot of people here when it happened. And it's not really, uh, wouldn't really be very smart of me to deny that it had happened. Instead, we kind of, we talk about it so that we can learn from it and so that we can understand what happened. I'll just give you, in the couple of minutes I have, and then we'll go to questions, I want to give you some things that you can look for uh, if, you're, if, if you're trying to determine if the culture that you have is supportive and energizing and healthy. Here are some things that, that I think will be true. First of all, healthy cultures are marked by empowerment. That's a dangerous word. A lot of people misinterpret that, but um, empowerment is when people are given responsibility and accountability, and we're going to talk about accountability too, and, and that and they're allowed to have success as an individual as well as success in the group, right? So we want things to be good for each person as well as good for the, for the whole group. And we want to push that empowerment as far down in the organization as possible. We want to, to enable people to make decisions if it's at all possible. In order to do that, everybody has to understand what we're trying to accomplish. So that's back to that mission and the vision and our, our strategy all has to be laid out in the open. Everybody has to know what we're doing so that all the decisions that they make are aligned with what we're trying to accomplish. Healthy cultures, people in healthy cultures are held accountable. Um, that's a really important thing. When we're talking about respecting people and valuing people, we're not talking about just, you know, we're all skipping around Kimray campus holding hands and singing Kumbaya. When people don't do their jobs, we have to hold them accountable for that. 
But here's the thing, you have to hold people accountable for things they can control. So at Kimray, right now, we're suffering, right? The oil and gas industry sucks, if I can be blunt. I'm not holding my salespeople accountable for our low sales. They have nothing to do with it. We couldn't, we can't sell more product. It's not being, there's no wells being drilled. Nobody's doing anything. So to yell at our salespeople and, and, you know, beat them isn't going to do any good, right? I have to hold them accountable for what they can do. And there's lots of things that we're, that we are asking them to do. And as long as they do them, then they're doing their job. If you give people power and there's no accountability, you have chaos. So you need to address the issues as they come up and resolve those where they exist, right? We try to resolve issues with people with those people instead of generating blanket rules for everybody and punishing everybody for something. People who live in healthy cultures are courageous. And that's what we all want as leaders. We want the people that we're leading to be courageous. We don't want to have to tell everybody everything to do. We want them to take those risks and do those things. And so as a leader, you have to set your personal interests aside and act according to the core values of your organization, even when that's risky. You've got to lead. You've got to be out in front. You've got to be taking that risk and be courageous for them also. Demonstrate those behaviors. And finally, healthy cultures have humble leadership. A humble leader is not somebody who says, oh, I'm terrible, you know, I'm no good at this. I'm not talking about false humility. We're talking about a humble leader is somebody who will admit their mistakes, somebody who will accept criticism, because we don't always do it right. We don't always have the right answer. We have to value different viewpoints. We really, as leaders, should be looking for other people's viewpoints, because that's going to expand the way we see the world and going to help us make better decisions. And then we need to push other people to the front. I know so many organizations who the, the leadership is the only people you ever see. At Kim Ray, we try really hard to get other, you know, all of our people out in front as often as we can and give them an opportunity to talk about what the company's doing, what, what they're doing, give them an opportunity to tell the story instead of it always being me or always being my executive vice president. So the way things were, I grew up with the wrong belief system. It almost destroyed my life, certainly impacted Kim Ray, but I got an opportunity, I got a second chance, as, as many of us do, to transform myself and therefore to get an opportunity to come back and be part of a transformation at Kim Ray. And the way things are now, we're not perfect, we're an organization of imperfect people and we make a lot of mistakes, but hopefully we give each other grace for that. And we are trying to create a culture and environment here where everybody is equally valued and cared for and respected and out of that, they have the capacity then to do great things, both here at Kimray and also in their families and in their communities. And I really think at the end of the day, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something here that, that, you know, you may call me on, but I don't think that that's just a good idea. You know, having an empowered culture that's marked by honesty and unity, that, you know, serving, having leaders that serve and treat, uh, treat everybody else as their equal and recognizing the intrinsic value. I don't think that's just a good idea. I think it is our sacred duty as leaders. And if we don't do that, I don't think we are acting ethically or morally. That's just my, my two cents. So thank you for listening to me. And now I think we've got about, what, 10 minutes. If people want to ask some questions or maybe have already asked some questions, I'll try to answer them. Bailey? Yeah, we actually do have a couple of great questions already. So um, can you hear me, by the way? We're all good here. I can hear you. I hope okay. everybody else can. Great. Perfect. Um, so we had a question from Melissa that says, does this work in the opposite direction? How would you approach your hierarchy if you notice this type of the toxic behaviors? Yeah. So um, if, I, if I understand the question, the question is, if you're not the leader, can you influence the leader to make that transformational change? Um, I'm going to say that we always can influence the people around us in some way. How effective that is, there's so many variables that are going to be involved in that, that I'm not really sure that I can specifically answer that. But uh, anytime you've got a, a, a situation where someone is not being transparent, is not being honest, um, if you can uh, bring that to light in a respectful way, in a way that doesn't violate someone's human, human dignity, then, then there's an opportunity for them to recognize that in themselves. There's an opportunity for them to see that. It would depend a lot upon, you know, how severe the, the situation is. I will tell you this, if somebody had come to me 
weeks or even months before everything kind of blew up for me at Kim Ray and said, Hey, you know, I, I don't think the way you're running Kim Ray is working. Or if they'd said, Hey, I'm, I'm going to call you on this. I had so much stuff built up around me that, uh, you know, ways that I uh, made excuses for things and covered for things and, and shifted things around. I don't think I would have seen it for me. Unfortunately, it took kind of everything blowing up, but that's not true for everybody. There are lots and lots of leaders who, um, when they when they kind of get a feel for what it's like to be in the organization that they're leading, uh, they go, wait a minute, that doesn't feel very good to me. And one of the things that we're trying to do at Kimray is create an opportunity to bring leaders in and, and kind of walk them through an exercise where we say, you know, put yourself in the position of somebody that works in your company and think about what their day is like and the kind of things that they run into. Uh, Travis, you, you were talking about reading my book. The, the book opens with kind of a made up story about a guy named Conrad and kind of a day in his life. And it sucks, right? I mean, you know, he, he's not getting, you know, nobody respects him and nothing's happening the way it should happen. He's got a leader that, you know, is just running rampant. And, and it, it's very much written from a standpoint of how it makes Conrad feel and the impact it has on, on his life. If we can get leaders to think that, you know, to, to put themselves in that position and walk through that, I think a lot of people would change. And that, that's kind of one of the hopes I have. So I don't know if that helps Melissa very much in terms of, I, I guess you could get my book and just kind of leave it on, his, leave it on your leader's desk maybe. Um, if you need one, I'll give you one. I'm not trying to promote you buying my book. You call me and I'll give you a book. But uh, I've had a number of people who have done that. said, hey, I'm going to give this to the, my boss and see what happens. So. All right. Um, that's wonderful. Um, I actually had a question. Um, so when you establish a great culture like this, I think you want to make sure that everyone who comes into your company is also either going to embody some of these cultural traits or share these beliefs or, um, will buy into them. So, um, I guess I'm wondering how do you identify these traits within people who, who are interviewing with you and what does your onboard, onboarding process look like to try to preserve that culture? That's a great question. Um, it's really actually very difficult to figure out who people are through just an interview or through a, an application. And I know that uh, tons of work and there's lots of people who are way better at it. But, but the, at the end of the day, um, obviously you can sort people to, to some level, but eventually you're just going to have to try them out in the organization. And so I think what's really important is um, we, we, you know, for everything other than just really entry level positions, we have multiple people interview because uh, different people are going to pick up on different things. Certainly if we're hiring from a management position or an executive position, they're going to go through a lot of interviews, some of them in groups, some of them one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, we like to go out to dinner with them, bring their spouse along with them and, and go to dinner and, and just see what they're like in a social setting. And, and, and then we get back together and we talk about that. But at the end of the day, uh, you're, when you bring somebody into an organization or a community, you're taking a risk. You're taking a risk and they're taking a risk. And so I think the more important thing is what our onboarding is like. So in onboarding, we spend two days with people in onboarding, everybody. If you get hired to, you know, to pick parts at Kimray, which is an entry level position, you don't have to have any skill, you don't have to know anything, we'll teach you that job, just walk in off the street you're still gonna go through two days of onboarding, which includes myself and, and our president coming in and visiting with you. And so we do a lot to communicate, this is who we are, this is what it's like to be part of Kimray, this is our expectation for the people that are a part of Kimray. And we're very clear about that up front, and we're very clear about the fact that we're gonna be watching to see if, if they're doing that, if they're fitting into that. And then everybody's on probation, right? So we're watching very closely for those first few months, uh, up to six months, to see if that's, if that's working out. Now, there's a big difference between people's, uh, how people behave in terms of their ethics and, and, and respecting other people and their personality, right? So we have a lot of different personalities. We have a lot of different backgrounds, a lot of different faith systems, a lot of, I mean, you name it, we've got th those differences. What I tell everybody is what you have to have to, to do well at Kimry, what you have to have to belong at Kimry is you have to agree with us that everybody is equally intrinsically valuable and you have to act that way, which means you have to respect everybody around you. And when we see people acting in ways that demonstrate that they don't respect the people that they work with, 
and that they don't care enough about them to modify their own behavior so that everybody around them feels safe and feels cared for, then those are the people that probably aren't going to do well at Kimray. And we try to deal with that pretty quickly. But mostly, um, after some amount of time, it becomes you become known for what you are. Kimray is known for the culture that we have, and the people that apply here want to be part of the culture that we have at Kimray. People who aren't going to you know, people who don't respect other people would not feel comfortable here. And so we, I typically think they probably don't, not very many of them apply. We're also real picky and we only hire about one out of 20 people that apply at Kimray. So. Wow. Well, I would say you all have done a great job of cons preserving that culture. I had a lot of interaction with Kimray at a past job and I just remember thinking, wow, everyone here is so nice. Do you have to be nice to get hired? So um, yeah, you've done a wonderful job. Um, we, had, um, we had another question actually from Travis. It says you were in rehab for 67 days. So how did you know you were ready to get out? Yeah, well, you don't get to decide when you're ready to get out of rehab. <laughs> the, the case manager decides that for you. And uh, a really short, funny story. You know, remember I told you I'm, I'm, I'm a performance person, right? So I get into rehab and for the first couple of weeks, when I got out, they gave me a copy of the notes uh, that, that my case manager had taken on me. And for the first few weeks that I was in rehab, the notes all read something more or less like this. Thomas is working really hard. He's doing the assignments really fast. He doesn't have the slightest idea what he's doing. So I was, I just went in, you know, I was at that point, I didn't understand. I was just doing my performance thing. And, and it took time to, to kind of learn that, that what they were trying to get was for me to, to, to open up and to understand the problems that I had and the, and the way that my belief system had gotten off track. I was like that rocket and it just took a, a degree of difference early on in my life, but I stayed on that track and, and the more time and the older I got, just the farther and farther away from anything that was that, that would make sense. And we just had to unpack all that stuff and they decide for you. So um, at some point they said, we think you're ready. And, and uh, they let me go home, which I was very happy for. Yeah. I, I, I say everybody probably needs to go to rehab. Most people probably can't. I would never do it again uh, volitionally, but it's probably the best thing that happened to me in terms of my personal development. I wish it had happened earlier. I wish I hadn't spent so much of my life uh, misdirected. But well. Thomas, I work with the uh, companies that have reduction workforce, and occasionally I'll have someone go through a program that would like to go to Kimray. So I have a copy of your book, and I always give them that book, Recovering Leadership, Musings of an Attic Leader, because I think that well describes your culture. That book is uh, really excellent, and and uh, it, it, it describes it so well. And um, well, the guy that uh, read it really did appreciate uh, knowing some more about you before we applied there. So if someone applies for your company, give them the book. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. How about the Monday musings? Uh, you, you do that every week still with all of your. I do. Employees? Yes. That, that and interestingly enough, that started out as I, I just emailed that to my executive leadership. I was concerned that um, they didn't understand how I connected things. Cause I tend to pull things from all over the place and kind of put them together. It's how my mind works. And I thought, you know, if they're going to participate with me in vision and missioning and on all the things that we're doing, they need to understand how I think that was really all I was trying to do. And they very quickly started sharing it with other people. And it got to the point where we were emailing it a lot of places. And so finally we made it a, uh, you can just get on the website and sign up for it. And um, yeah, I do that. It comes out every Monday morning. Uh, rarely does it not come out on Monday morning. I've missed it every once in a while. I go, oh, it's Tuesday and I didn't send the music out. But almost every Monday morning. And uh, it's just, it's exactly what it says. It's the musings of an addict leader. So it's, uh, it's what I'm thinking about. It's what's happening in my life. It's always related to leadership. It's always related to uh, kind of our experiential uh, way that we interact with one another. And, um, and sometimes it's, uh, I bring weird things in. I, I listen to a lot of music. And so there's liable to be a, a lyric from a song you've never heard in there or an article I read or something that, that you know, happened in my backyard. I, you know, who knows? So so does this go to all your employees every week as well, besides your leadership team now? Yeah, we don't, uh, we don't uh, force anybody to take it, but everybody, everybody can sign up for it if they want to. So, so you have I a lot don't of have any else. idea how many of them are reading it or not. <laughs> you have how many people signed up and to receive this now? Do you have any idea? I don't. I don't pay any attention to it. I just stick it out there and, and move on. So. Well, I've enjoyed it.
Well, thank you very much. All right. Well, I think that looks like all of our questions for now. Um, I just want to say thank you to everyone for coming. Thank you, Thomas, for sharing and being so open with us and um, just for all of these wonderful thoughts for today. I know we're seeing lots of thank you messages coming through the chat right now um, for your transparency, for sharing um, your honesty and the truth about your story. And um, I would say that uh, the results have been amazing and something that we can all definitely um, go implement. So um, again, we appreciate you. Uh, we appreciate you being here. Um, thank you to everyone who's here. Don't forget if you want your CPE to just put your name and CPE in the chat. I know lots of you have done that already. And um, I think that's it for us today. So thanks so much. And um, hopefully we'll see you again in person soon. If not, hopefully on another webinar. <laughs> I would love that. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank yes. you all. Good to Thank see you. Thank you all. Bye now. Bye.